Welcome back, beautiful people. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sams. Today in our Fly Me to the Moon segment, we're chatting with one of Virgin Galactic's founding astronauts, Pierre Wimmer. He's a returning contributor. And we're discussing whether alien life really exists. As the head of NASA thinks we're not alone in the universe and says aliens definitely exist and they could be living among us right here. And besides, who are we to say that planet Earth is the only location of a life form that is civilized and organized? In June, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a report that found the U.S. government couldn't explain 143 cases of unidentified flying objects reported by the military from 2004 to 2021. UFOs are real. Just ask the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy just acknowledged that three clips of declassified military footage released between 2017 and 2018 are actually unidentified aerial phenomena. Their words, not ours. Which, of course, begs the question, are we actually alone? NASA is constantly looking for proof of life in the universe, including on Mars. Furthermore, Britain's first astronaut, Helen Sherman, who visited the Soviet MIR space station in 1991, said that aliens exist. There's no two ways about it. Aliens definitely exist, and it's possible they're living among us right here on Earth, but have gone undetected so far, quote, end quote. The belief in alien encounters has long been a prominent feature of American life. A 1997 poll from CNN Time on the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident, found that 80% of Americans think the government is hiding knowledge of the existence of extraterrestrial life forms. Here to give us some perspective is my good friend and astronaut, Pierre Wimmer. Welcome to the show, superstar, and nice to have you back on. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be back. All right, let's chat Roswell, okay? So we all know that the town of Roswell in New Mexico became shorthand for alien encounters back in 1947 after reports flying object crash landed in a field, right? So the, uh, the Roswell Army Airfield initially said a flying disc had been recovered, but a second press release clarified that the object was from a weather balloon. And since then, a number of supposed witnesses have said that they saw military take away the flying disc and bodies of aliens. Okay, fill us in here. Fact or fiction, there's also a museum there um, the UFO Museum remains a major destination for alien enthusiasts in Roswell. Talk to me about this. Sure. Uh, most, most of these incidents, and there have been quite a few, uh, we all have to acknowledge, uh, particular around uh, Roswell, the white, the white missile range, uh, the white sands missile range, and also around uh, Area 51 in Nevada. Most of those things uh, actually have a very good explanation. It's just the U.S. Uh, military can't tell you about it because it's so top, top secret. It's even so, if you look at Area 51, it's even so top secret that it's not like any uh, fighter jet uh, pilot can just fly over there. There's literally sort of a no-fly zone, not just for commercial traffic, but also for military craft, etc. So when the U.S. Uh, military is de developing new systems, etc., and this goes all the way back to, uh, well, with Area 51, back to 1955, when they originally bought the site, the U.S. military, uh, to test the U-2 spy plane, you know, the, the, the high-flying spy plane that was famous during the Cub uh, Cuban crisis. That goes all the way back to that. They wanted to do that secret stuff that nobody else uh, could know about because it was so competitive in terms of technology. And that's why they can't really talk about it, let alone try to uh, confirm or deny it. Um, oh. so, but a lot of these incidents actually have a pretty good explanations, but only very few people know. Very few people know that's true. And, and the area, Area 51, in reference that you're talking to, what a fun fact has long been, of course, the focus of public interest. But Area 51 has been a prominent pop culture reference and made a notable appearance in the alien invasion movie Independence Day. So I'm glad you brought that one up. Now, on another note, the largest spacecraft, spacecraft ever built is expected to reach orbit for the first time in March of this year, and if all goes as planned, will be one huge step closer to a future in which space flight is cheaper and more accessible than ever before. But 
The challenge is that the launch costs severely limit our, our extraterrestrial reach, so to speak. And that's because every extra ounce of weight included in a rocket's payload increases the amount of expensive fuel required to break free of Earth's gravity. Talk to me about the development of reusable rockets that effectively, when they, when they um, get down to Earth, they don't crash up and burn or become space junk. Well, reusability in terms of rockets uh, is really key to keep the costs uh, uh, low, really, really low. And this, this was originally envisioned by NASA when, when the space shuttle was, was put in place because you could reuse it again and again. And it did help to a degree to bring down cost. However, if you look at the U.S. space shuttle, the average cost is at least $500 million all in. So it's not small change, uh, out of, even out of a NASA budget when, when the shuttle was going up and down. It's now been decommissioned. But one person who really picked up on this was Elon Musk and SpaceX. He really understood to bring down the cost. So you, uh, uh, you really have to reuse and reuse and reuse. And he did that. So to ride on a Falcon 9 rocket going up to the International Space Station would probably set you back 60 odd million dollars which is a fraction of the of the 500 million dollars uh, that that the uh, shuttle would cost to to ride as it were and when it comes to starship that's the same principle applied except on a mega scale i mean starship is a bfr a big f rocket as as they would say it's it's really it's bigger than saturn 5 which is one of the biggest rockets ever built saturn 5 was the one that took apollo 11 to pa the moon apollo to the, the moon time. yes wow yeah. so this 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 uh elon musk space x starship um is expected to in fact be the world's largest most powerful launch system because like you said the current record holder was uh saturn 5 which is crazy to me that this is how far we've come uh in such a short time really when you talk when you when you're talking about space tourism um starship, uh, starship has the double amount of thrust as a saturn V, so it's almost like two saturn V rockets stick to stick together i mean it's enormous the ambition for this is is crazy if you think about it but that's what it takes um and and that's the innovation that's going on at spacex at the moment what elon is going to do with this he's going to create the uh, starlink satellite system he will uh, hopefully in the mid uh, 2020s take astronauts to the moon and, and obviously, he hopes that eventually he'll bring uh, people all the way to Mars. Now, there's a big difference going to the moon and going to Mars. Moon, you can hop up in a, in a couple of days. Mars, you're looking at, a, at, at at least a, a good uh, seven months uh, one-way trip. So it, it, it's a very big, big thing. But he has very big ambitions. He does. And oh, well, that, that was very insightful information. I had no idea that there was such a time difference between, um, you know, the moon and Mars, so to speak. Now, um, when we talk about these reusable rocket ships, obviously this is going to pave the way of the future because the cost of the rockets themselves that are not reusable, that are designed for just one launch, you know, after delivering their payloads, say they're crash um, back down to Earth and burn up in atmosphere or become that spaceship we talked about. So the SpaceX, um, this SpaceX Starship is really expected to be revolutionary. And what um, what we could see from there, from what I'm hearing you say, is this is going to be begin to enable all kinds of missions that aren't currently possible, uh, totally changing the way that we that we can do solar system exploration. And that's essentially where we're headed. Now, I just wanted to touch on one more thing. When future generations write about the history of space travel, definitely 2021 is going gonna, is gonna to get its own chapter. I mean, it's the years of the, it's the year of the billionaires, essentially. The trio of space billionaires that went into space, Branson, Bezos, and Elon Musk, have their eyes set squarely on the future here. But where do you think that space tourism... Where, when do you think space tourism will become mainstream enough where, where we could see the cost per ticket um, lowering to incentivize the world to just jump on board? We have about a minute left. Okay, I, I think um, uh, this year, 2022, there's going to be a lot of exciting launches going on. Artemis 1 for 1 is going to be a, a major national mission, mission. There'll be more, uh, no doubt, Blue Origin missions going on. But I think going into 2023, you're really going to start to see space tourism take off. And there'll be a lot more people, including myself. I, I hope to fly that year. 
Um, and then after that, I think you've got to fast forward at least a good four or five years out before the cost of, of the ticket price comes down. For now, they've already been going up, not down, sadly. Yeah. But over time, uh, I think it will be possible for most people with equity value in their, in their own homes, uh, so to speak, to, to extract money enough to, to fly to space. So it will probably come down to $50,000 or so. That's brilliant because right now it's 250,000 US dollars upwards. So 50,000 makes it much more believable. Well, thank you so much, my friend, for, for coming on board on Fly Me to the Moon. It's always very exciting having you on. You're full of insight. Thank you very much. See you in space. See you in space. You better take me with you. That was Pierre Wimmer from Wimmer Space. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. That was Fly Me to the Moon. <laughs> 